The ideas expressed in the following presentations are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of ACI or its committees. ACI web sessions are recorded at ACI conventions or other concrete industry events and will be made available for viewing free of charge for one week. Thereafter, they will be archived on the ACI website or added to ACI's online CEU program depending on their content. You can earn continuing education credits through ACI's online CEU program. Visit www.concrete.org to register. ACI conventions provide an opportunity for networking and for keeping up to date with the latest in concrete technology and practices. Our next presentation is from Kyle Renever. Uh, Kyle graduated in May. They have a tendency of doing this, and went to work for Union Pacific. So, unfortunately, you are going to have to put up with me. Um, we're going to discuss the use of shrinkage compensating concrete in an underground water tank, or an alternate title, in situ testing of shrinkage compensating concrete. Uh, this is going to go rather rapid. Three research locations. One is a restrained tank in Springfield, Illinois. Unrestrained, totally unrestrained slab on ground in Los Angeles. And restrained slabs on ground in Fears Lab at the University of Oklahoma in Norman. Purpose of the research. Basically to have a better understanding of what goes on in tank walls and slabs, especially as it, as it pertains to shrinkage comp. Uh, review the ACI 223 notes on uh, sequencing of production, i.e. 223 says that you have to skip sections and come back and fill them in, which is extremely expensive when you're a contractor, versus a continuous flow of work. Uh, strain evaluations of a wall during construction, we're going to review the base boundary conditions of the tank on walls. There were some questions of whether your wall should be designed to slide at its base because of the expansion in shrinkage comp, or is a typical tank de detailing with high fixity, high, high amount of uh, restraint at the base okay? And look at the long-term shrinkage. Uh, previous research, and please forgive me, I'm American, so my uh, Chinese is going to be wrong here, probably. Jing Jing, or I, it's probably wrong. Temperature impact on shrinkage comp basically said at 100 degrees Fahrenheit there was no problems, actually increased um, expansion, faster strength, but at 160 under electron microscope, um, this is not from testing, they saw ettringite crystals degrading and then uh, the belief that uh, strength and expansion would not occur properly. Um, as Eskildsen et al. Uh, started to look at vibrating wire strain gauges in post tension shrinkage comp. And this is where I started to get the idea that this was a possibility for an in-situ test. Uh, maximum expansion was about 140 microstrains, uh, match shrinkage about 120. And um, for his work, uh, it worked performed better than uh, Portland cement-based systems. Zia et al. in 2009 on vibrating wire strain gauges uh, was using this for a skyscraper. <laughs> We had this interesting idea that he should encase them in concrete first before encasing them in the specimen that he's actually studying. Created uh, five days in which he had a whole bunch of noise, which on review of this research told us that we did not want to go this route. Um, we needed to embed directly into the concrete. Equipment is basically vibrating wire string gauge. It's plucking essentially a guitar string has an amp pickup just like on an electric guitar and basically listens to the pitch. If the pitch goes up, you're basically elongating or stretching the wire. If the pitch goes down, you're sh shrinking and shortening it. Pr pretty simple. Compensation for temperature is included. Using uh, Geocon data acquisition from the Geotex. Uh, 16 channels, fairly easy to get. First is uh, looking at a 6 million gallon underground clear water well, Springfield, Illinois, at the power plant. 
Uh, plant walls are actually tapered. They're 18 inches at the top. They're 18 foot tall. They're 42 inches at the bottom. Uh, three vibrating wire gauges up at the top, one vertical, horizontal, and lateral. We'll get into orientations uh, in a little bit. Five at the base of the wall, the vertical and horizontal on each of the faces, and the one lateral you can see there right smack in the middle. Strain gauge isolated from the rebar. Method number one was to put them on little teeny number two rods. Basically allows them free movement. The other method was to use what Geocon suggested, which was little foam blocks. Idea is to isolate them from the rebar so you're not just looking at the strains of the rebar, but looking at the strains in the concrete. Wires had to be wire tied to the, the rebar frame to allow it not to rip your wires apart when they go into construction, right? You're going to be vibrating next to these and doing some pretty uh, aggressive action. Uh, wires were fed through the formwork, and this is an active uh, site. Trying to keep them from destroying your wires is a, is a contest. Uh, we did lose one of our gauges due to this, actually two. Um, over time, you'll notice this. Once during the construction, early construction process, and then once when they went to uh, changing some of their wall, wall forms. It's just going to happen. There's no way around it. Test set up data acquisition system. It <laughs> worked pretty nice. Um, system ran for 170 days. We're taking intervals every 15 minutes. Um, if you've got a grad student to do that, they would revolt. After initial setup, uh, they poured the tank walls 23 days later. The second adjoining tank wall cap was poured at 35 days. Springfield mix is fairly standard, 418 pounds of cement, 90 pounds of CSA, 0.07% expansion according to the C878. Uh, modulus testing back at the lab. Modulus is about what you would expect for Portland cement. This modulus is actually taken by concrete strain gauges on a 6x12, and we get really nice results out of it. This is why we do it. It's good practice for my grad students. Um, testing horizontal, so the little round dots represent the strain gauge that is going in and out of the screen. Arrows just point out where they're located. Uh, this is early age at uh, 1.5 days. Um, the horizontal outside at the bottom is going to be in red, always horizontal inside gray, horizontal top in yellow. Wet curing occurred. You can basically see exactly when wet curing occurs. Notice that on the microstrains, though, you are below five microstrains. We're essentially at zero. Uh, 878 doesn't even start to register until 10 microstrains. This is actually off the chart for normal procedures. So actually getting you better results in the field than you can get in the lab. Um, this is, you'll notice the horizontal top dies out at about 100 days. That's when someone used a spade and cut one of our wires. Um, note that overall we have shrinkage is always going to be positive, expansion always negative in this batch of, of series, and you're looking at expansion of less than 40 microstrains. It's a highly restrained system. You didn't get a large expansion like you see in an 878, but you didn't get any shrinkage either. So essentially you're a restrained system, but you are getting your, your what you want, which is a compressed system. Joining wall added, cap added. Okay. Just to give you an idea of what this actually means, that last slide, looking out to about nine days, the yellow line is what is a normal concrete, Portland cement concrete at Fears Lab. That little squiggly up at the top is what's happening in the tank. Essentially zero, nothing, neutral. Wonderful, isn't it? We don't have to worry about it expanding or shrinking. Okay, looking at vertical, lines are up and down. That's the orientation of our, our vibrating wire strain gauges now. Uh, early age. Fairly the same, slightly higher on the vertical inside. You're up to the lofty goal of nine microstrains. Uh, wet curing added. At uh, 175 days, uh, you're still essentially at less than 40 microstrains. Nothing going on. It's just starting to get boring. Joining wall added. Transverse, top 
and bottom. Um, unfortunately, the top, I think, had some problems early age. We'll see. It might show up. This might be a graphing issue. But here you, you even have less. We're down to two microstrains. Oh, my God. Wet curing added. And, yeah, there it is. Top transverse. And overall, you're still at less than 40 microstrains. On a normal 878, that is four little marks on your dial indicator. And when you spin the 878, that needle is moving probably 10. You cannot get this accuracy in the lab, period. And you were doing this in the field in an active construction site with people who don't care about our equipment at all. Pretty nice. Okay. Looking at the temperatures, nice thing about this equipment, it compensates for temperature. This was basically done in the fall, decreasing temperature going into the fall. Max temperature within the concrete was 132. It's less than the discussion at 160, degrading of Ettringite, no problem. We didn't really test his, his theory on the degradation of Ettringite. We'll have to do that some other time. Looked at vibrating wire strain gauges in the slabs, uh, thin slabs, uh, attached directly to the rebar, isolation with little pink foam. Also in the thick slab, 18 inches around the perimeter underneath the wall. Uh, this is the 18 inches down right before the concrete buries it. The 80 by 184 foot slab cast at one time one morning, and the red arrows locate where our wires are basically our vibrating wire strain gauges are. We're doing two directions parallel to the edge and perpendicular to the edge. Looking at the finished products, roughly where they're located. You can see the little pink wires coming up underneath the gravel, which comes up to our data recorder. <laughs> <coughs> Testing perpendicular to the edge. Um, we only have one, and that's for the thick slab. The thin slab got killed off during construction. And early age, we got up to 25 uh, microstrains of, of uh, shrinkage, wet cure, and essentially nothing long term. It's really getting boring. Parallel to the, the edge, so now we're going in line with the wall. Early age, you're up to a shrinkage of about 24 microstrains, and wet curing occurs, and then long term, uh, essentially zero. Nothing happening. Uh, temperature here, max temperature got to about 125, slightly less, which is understandable. It's a thinner, thinner section, right? 18 inches versus something like 42 on the, the wall sections. Uh, looking at restraints tests, is it, are the worst overall, the highest one is 41 microstrains on the interior bottom vertical. Uh, in this case, it's 33 on the transverse top. Basically, not an issue. So, why do we not see the 0.07% expansion? Why does it not expand beyond seven days? You have slab to grade restraints, you have slab restraints to the wall, you have differences in surface to volume ratios, which are noted here at the bottom. Um, surface to vol volume for an 878 is basically 14. On our wall sections, it's 1.075, right? So you're not going to give up, you're not going to have drying shrinkage as fast on these wall sections. None of our, of our concrete is three inches thick on each side, right? I don't see anybody casting beams three by three, right? So essentially, all of our concrete behaves better than what we have been talking about coming from the lab, period. Unrestrained testing. It's been a discussion in 223 that you cannot cast a unrestrained type K shrinkage comp without it blowing apart. Well, I wanted to see what it would do. Blowing apart is sort of fun to me. So we decided to put no rebar in the slab. I had someone crazy enough to want to do it, and we tested it for 70 days. Basically, this mix has less cement than what we were talking. Now we're at 408 pounds. Uh, per cubic yard, type 1, 90 pounds of, of uh, type K shrinkage comp. Orientation of the vibrating wire strain gauges, uh, they're isolated on pieces of rebar, pounded into the ground, 
there is a plastic sheeting put underneath the slab to even further reduce the friction to the, the base. Measuring in two directions, parallel to the slab edge, perpendicular to the slab edge, three heights, uh, at basically one and a half inch increments through a six inch slab, and we offset them so that you don't get interaction between your strain gauges. We're trying to get them far enough apart so that I don't get a cracking problem, I don't duplicate answers. Uh, two locations, one in the middle of the slab, one at the edge of the slab. Looking at it vertically, uh, plan view looking down, you have a mature concrete carport that we're casting against. Everything in gray was cast at the same time. The lower portion has 12 inches on center rebar. The center portion roughly 30 feet by 46 feet, no rebar whatsoever. First one, middle of the slab parallel with the edge. Early age. Um, you have expansion, roughly 100 microstrains, and you have a, a very a behavior here of where the top is actually expanding more than the middle and the bottom. We'll see that's fairly common. <coughs> uh, middle of the slab for long term at 70 days. I'm sorry about the scatter. These are just actually graphing data points. There are no lines involved. Uh, the top is in yellow, the middle is in red and the gray is the bottom. Um, gray has, is more expansion and your top is basically the same as your, your mid, midline. Middle of slab perpendicular to edge. Same sort of trends. You can literally see when uh, water curing was put on. And long term, bottom is expanded more than the top. Edge of slab, parallel to the edge. Early age, same trend. Later age, your bottom was expanding greater up until about age 28, and then for some reason, and we think this, this might, there might be an anomaly in there, the middle changed uh, roughly by about 80 microstrains. Perpendicular to the edge, same trend and then expansion long term. Notice that none of them actually go back and start shrinking. Right? You've expanded and you're not shrinking. Okay, so we decided to embed one of these vibrating wire strand gauges in 6x12. One of the ideas is to move away from the 878 and 157 and try to get something that gives us a little better result that is not biased towards the operator. Uh, 6x12 cylinder, you can notice when it was put in the water, and gives us a very similar curve to what we see in an 878 with the exception that it also handles the tension part. Right? You have the expansion, which in this case is downward, and then you also have a tension part, which according to 878 you would have to truncate at roughly 20 days, which is roughly where a lot of 878 bars actually truncate anyway. Okay, unrestrained test results in a nutshell. We're looking at from the top to the bottom, you're getting an increasing expan expansion towards the bottom of your slabs. You're also getting increased expansion in the order of, that I presented them, middle parallel, middle, middle perpendicular. Now, why is that? What it boils down to is restraint. Middle, middle parallel, you're looking at pushing in one direction 15 feet of wet concrete and 25 feet of mature concrete. In another direction, you're looking at 45 feet of wet concrete. Right? That is the most restrained system we have here. The next one, perpendicular with edge, you're looking at 23 feet of concrete in each direction. In this edge, it looks like you're pushing an awful lot, but we're going to show that just because you constrain in one direction does not mean you constrain in another. This has a Poisson's effect going on, which I believe has a Poisson's. We have yet to test it and prove it. Let's put it, be honest about that. And then the least ex, ex, uh, restrained is you have 45 feet of concrete on one side, you have six inches on the other. I think all of us can agree that's not much restraint, six inches of concrete. So looking at restrained tests, um, decided that that test in LA was more of a, let's see what we can get out of the situation. Uh, the restraint test at Fears Lab was going to be more of a control test. 
We're doing four 15 by 50s, six inch slabs. Uh, two of them use a number four rebar, 14 inches on center at mid, mid height. Two of them have two number five rebars around the perimeter. Um, our vibrating wire strain gauges are now hung off of uh, zip ties, totally free to essentially move, so there's no possibility of constraint here, and the same one and a half inches through the depth. Um, this is what the 14 inch uh, on center number fours ends up looking like. It's fairly highly constrained, and you'll notice uh, we have. Um, in line longitudinal, transverse at different locations, <laughs> three different locations down the length of this. Transverse rebar basically expands to 250 and uh, drops off to about 100. Um, this is a, as far as we've gone on data reduction. We are now out to about 90 days, but our data is running about 60 days behind. It's a lot of, of material to work through. The longitudinal essentially coming down to zero. Unrestrained six by twelves, on the other hand, have slightly less expansion, uh, which we do not understand since they're totally unrestrained, while the others had rebar around them. <laughs> the other system is, are two number fives around the perimeter. It's basically. Um, Think of it as a rubber band around the edge of your slab. This is definitely below the, the 223 requirements for uh, rebar reinforcing. Expansions are larger. Shrinkage um, effects are, the, the amount is about the same, but net effect is you're still expanded. Longitudinal, same way. Unrestrained 6x12s, this mix actually uses a different mix design. It has a higher amount of component, and it does have a higher expansion of an unrestrained 6x12. Conclusions. Restraining type K shrinkage compensated concrete in one direction does not restrain expansion in any other direction, i.e., restraining sigma 1 of a fundamental element does not restrain sigma 2 or sigma 3, the transverse elements, right? Just because you could control expansion upward doesn't mean it can't grow sideways, just like most of us. Right? I've reached my top, I'm moving sideways. Don't tell my wife that. Luckily, it's going in. Uh, type K shrinkage compensated concrete will not self-destruct at expansions acceptable to ACI 223 if there is no rebar. In the lab, we can get it to blow up at about 30%, uh, what you saw with Seth. If you add enough rebar to that system, it won't blow up even at that amount. Highly restrained placement of type K shrinkage compensated concrete will have minimum expansion and shrinkage, which goes to one of the questions before on what happens if you have a 100-foot slab. It's not linear. This material acts strange. You add restraint, it decides not to expand, but it decides not to shrink either. Wonderful stuff. Vibrating wire strain gauges are a suitable measuring term for shrinkage comp. They're durable, accurate, not prone to bias, and I emphasize accurate. You're talking about one microstrain accuracy when the best we can get on an 878 is 10, and that is with an operator bias. If I measure a prism and my students measure a prism, we will not get the same numbers. Scale of the project affects shrinkage comp. Greater surface volume versus volume of the prisms and wall may cause uh, discrepancies. Also, the amount of restraint that you have going on. And there is restraint in almost everything. Acknowledgements. We're thankful for the city of Springfield for actually living us on their job site and not getting mad at us when we were totally in their way. CTS for providing resources and ideas. University of Oklahoma for allowing me a lab where I can blow things up. Geocon for actually making something that works better in the field than I ever dreamed of. And ACI for 223 for some stimulating conversation. Thank you. Questions? Uh oh. Hey. <laughs> I was there. First, uh, very specifically, it's based on the documentation here of the actual data. Uh, in a highly restrained, which I consider highly restrained, structural concrete having two elements of reinforcement, two different planes. 
Can we get away from sequential, or can we get away from checkerboard placements and go to sequential placements? That is essentially a no-brainer. You have a system here that under proper restraints doesn't shrink and doesn't swell. Why do you have to wait so many days before you place something next to it? It's not going to move, folks. Right? We're, we're, these measurements are accurate. Right? We've done it more than once. We've double-checked our numbers, double-checked the equipment, made sure that Geocon says that it's doing what it's doing, checked it against what we have in the lab. I'm sorry to tell you, but if you're doing these tank walls, you can use standard rebar placement on the base of the tank wall, highly restrained, and you can do, use continuous forming for all I care, because it's not going to have a problem due to overexpansion. 40 microstrains. You have, you have something like five to 600 microstrains just due to the temperature variation of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, you don't get that in one night, but you definitely get 40 microstrains, I'll tell you that. Other questions? Anyone? Uh, in the Springfield tank, did the walls crack? They had, out of all the tanks, all the walls they had, they filled it up to 18 feet. They had something like 30 feet of, of seepage that they ended up going back and, and uh, back gouging and epoxying. What I had told them, if you wait a week, those would self-heal due to the swelling. But it's a government job, and they're going to run the way they want to. But 30 feet out of, uh, I mean, it's huge. And there's all these internal walls, too. I mean, it's, it's huge. So the contractor was very happy with it. Yeah. There's some actually present, but not intended. Yeah. And it, it gets into, uh, there's so many variations on a job site, but the, it, it really did work out sweet. Yeah. I believe I had a question here. Yes. Um, in, the, in the tank situation like this, um, using the regular coordinate cement, if you pour the mat, then you pour the wall. It depends on the, how long you wait between the time you pour the mat, then when you pour the wall. If you wait too long, the mat has shrunk to a certain degree, then you pour the first concrete, you have a vertical bar standing out, dowels standing out, and those dowels are causing vertical cracks in the wall. I just wonder if you use the uh, case cement. There is no waiting on the time difference that doesn't make any difference? Uh, we saw zero difference, and these are not dowels. These were literally rebar. They did not use dowels. They came straight up with rebar. There is no, quote, slip at this base at all. And uh, there was a water stop at mid-depth, mid, um, and vertical water stops and all glued together and all that wonderful stuff. Uh, but they poured as quickly as, I'd say, two weeks after casting of a slab, and as slow as almost a year and a half after casting a slab because of job construction issues. I mean, so you had everything from fairly green, what we would consider fairly green concrete, to mature concrete that they're putting walls on and no difference in behavior. Yeah. But with this material, you essentially are at neutral. You're in a beautiful situation. You really are. Yes. I'm curious about the use of the uh, vibrating wire strain gauges inside of the concrete because I'm not surprised you didn't see very much movement with them because okay, you, if, if you if you think of it as a simple system, you have like a radial expansion, so you would have an expansion, a lengthening of the strain gauge, but it's happening everywhere, so it's being pushed against by the neighboring location. Yeah, but you can't. Um, you're taking an argument that this discrete. Air, system is not expanding or shrinking because you have expansion here and expansion there. You can't have it both ways. You can't say that my, my area is growing on the outside and I'm not growing on the inside because it's pushing in. So you can't area, create that argument. Is the area growing on the outside? Well, I, we measured close to the outer edges. We're three inches off the outer faces. We're dead center in the middle of the slab. We're on slabs at one and a half inches from surfaces. 
you know, you're, you're talking about long surfaces, short surfaces. You are, this is discreetly measuring, just like a DMEC target or a surface strain gauge or any strain gauge, measure strain over an area. But to say that this doesn't move because of something happening out here, basically you, you can't make that argument because you're saying that magically this doesn't move, this moves, but it's free to move there. I'm sorry. If, if you're going to have a continuum and it's all behaving the same, it means that these two end pieces have to move apart or together. And what we've seen in behavior in the lab and the field is they actually work. I mean, they are monitoring and mimicking what we can measure in the lab. I, I believe that they're measuring something. Yeah? It's a question of what. Maybe something could be more interesting is actually to measure the pressure. Well, you see, that's the next step. We actually have pressure plates in them, but the data reduction on them is not finished. Um, we Part of it was, yes, we have movement, but then the question is, do you have compression? Because the compression is what you want. Movement may or may not make sense. I mean, it might expand. It could be. You could basically not have be creating compression. You could just be expanding. It doesn't help. But, yeah, we're moving in that direction. Absolutely. <laughs> yes. We'll have it in the 223 meeting. Question in the back. It may not have been in your presentation, but I have a question related to architectural concrete. Uh, do you have any information on heat of hydration, how they compare with the uh, normal portals and also the color consistency of the raw material from load to load, let's say, going into a... Uh, he has more on the color than I do. I have Essentially, these are uh, measurements of temperature over time. So the curvature on temperature over time is more complete than we have had in the past. The thing is you don't have controlled situation. Is 